I always do that. I always forget to activate my mic, don't I? All right, now, is everything working? Yes, everything looks like it's up. You can hear me. Let's see if you can hear the keyboard. Yes, awesome. So, everything is up and running. We're good. Time for another live stream, and today is going to be a fun one. We get to talk about one of my favorite concepts in music, which is, of course, orchestration. Uh, one second after last week's technical difficulty, let me make sure, yep, it should be set up to the right. Uh, we got it set up to voice meter, so awesome. Welcome everybody, if there are any new faces, welcome back. As usual, you can feel free to follow along with the lesson plan notes, which are below. You can download these below completely free. They cover everything we'll be going over today. Um, and these kinds of notes are with every single lesson plan. This is just the way I like to teach, right? I'd like you guys to walk home with some notes afterwards. Um, and as usual, if you got any questions, feel free to throw them in the comments below. I will be happy to address them. Uh, welcome, Sean. Welcome, Darlene. Sean, I am glad you like cats. Cats are okay. Uh, I, I'm allergic, though, so I can't be around them too much. Uh, but let's see here. So, yes, a couple quick check-in kind of things, right? So, lesson goals. Today, we're going to start talking about orchestration. The first two, six lessons in this series, we have learned how to study the score, study the film, figure out what your soundtrack should sound like, and hopefully, by now, you've got a nice sketch for most of your film. Since I haven't been working on this film off screen, I'm probably much further behind than all of you, all right? But uh, hopefully you have a sketch for pretty much most of the film by now because we're going to start talking about arranging it. And in particular, we're going to learn about the three pillars of all great arrangements, all great orchestration. We're going to learn about doubling instruments and how to properly do that. We're going to find out how to pick the best instruments to work with for any given layer of your music. And then, of course, we're going to kind of go through a uh, way of just applying everything. Now, as a heads up, orchestration and arranging is a very kind of in-depth field of study. All right, there are entire professions built around orchestration. I mean, every major film composer has orchestrators on, um, on uh, what's the payroll or whatever you want to say. Even John Williams at this point in the game will sketch out his music, but then he'll send it to an, in uh, an orchestrator to do all the fine detail work. That doesn't mean John Williams isn't writing his own music. In fact, most composers like Hans Zimmer and John Williams will write a majority of the music. But when you're working with a huge time crunch, they'll say, all right, I've got the sketch. I've got the basic idea. I need to move on. So I'm going to delegate one of my assistants to polish things up and finish the orchestration. Hans Zimmer is very famous for this. He gets put on these massive multi-million dollar uh, uh, blockbuster films with a very short turnaround and needs a big team. So Hans Zimmer will often be famous for writing incredible themes, incredible arrangements, creating these really cool sounds, and then saying, all right, I need to focus my time and talents on these big moments throughout the film. I need you to take this theme I wrote and rearrange it just to fit kind of this love scene kind of thing, basically delegating the less important scenes to his assistant, saying, here's my music, arrange it how you think it works, I'll give feedback on it. That's pretty par for the course in most blockbuster films kind of thing. So all of this to say that orchestration is a huge kind of monster that you can tackle, and we will not be able to do everything in one lesson. It's just impossible. I'm sorry. But we will cover some of the most important things. That being said, if you want to learn more, I have multiple playlists on orchestration that you can watch completely free. In fact, at the bottom of the lesson plan today, I've included several of them. Orchestration 101, very good information. It will get you started on instrumentation, how to use the different instruments of the orchestra, stuff like that. It uses a non-traditional pitch notation system, meaning that I don't follow scientific pitch notation. But I've I've explained what I do follow and stuff in the comments of each video, so hopefully it doesn't throw you off. Uh, this was before I had learned about scientific pitch notation. So it's an older one. Then, fundamental orchestration techniques, which is technically called advanced orchestration techniques. This is a fantastic resource for everyone who wants to learn. And then, temporarily, I do have a textbook available on my website. This is, unfortunately, temporary, as it says, because um, on June 30th, I need to take this off of my website. 
because it's currently being published by a publishing company. And so, yeah, I can't keep the digital copy on my website for much longer. Uh, but check that out if you want. All of that to say, those are additional resources you can work with. But today, we are going to focus on just covering the major kind of topics. What makes a good arrangement? How do you find the right instruments? And then how do you do doubling? And of course, all that, how to approach your orchestrations systematically. Um, well, let's see, uh, Darlene, if we don't get this orchestrated by the deadline, can we still submit the project? That's a really good question. I'm not sure. Um, I'd say submit whatever you've got. Or if you've paid for the competition when the deadline comes, which is July 28th, I believe. Uh, so you've still got over a month. Um, always submit. All right, submit whatever you have. Because, I mean, you've paid for it, right? You might as well get some feedback if you're paying for the feedback. Um, so, yeah, I'd say, unfortunately, I think the deadline, that's the deadline. All right, you cannot submit past the deadline. That's uh, July 28th again, but that's pretty par for the course. If you miss a deadline with a job as a film composer, then the entire thing gets held up and you're probably gonna get blacklisted and never find another job again. So with orchestration, a lot of it is minimal viable product. Get the minimum that you need to be working and then if you have time, polish it up. Um, Darlene, I thought it was June 28th. That's simple enough to find out, okay? Indie film music contest. All right, let's go here. Uh, let's find out where it is. The uh, submission deadline. Yeah, July twenty eighth. You've got over a, you've got over a month left, Darlene. All right, good for you. That's awesome. That should that should hopefully calm down. That would be. I would count that as a win. Having an extra month. But uh, awesome. So yeah, as we get ready to start, let me know in the comments if you have any questions. I'm going to split this up real quick. Uh, get this all taken care of. Excellent. All right, so now I can see everything. Things are nice. So yeah, let's dive right in. All right, so our first kind of point of discussion are going to be these things called the three pillars of great orchestration. All right, so if you don't remember anything else that I talk about today, these three are by far the most important. In fact, if you don't remember anything about orchestration ever, these three are the most important, all right? These transcend genre, meaning it doesn't matter what type of music you are writing. If you are making an arrangement where even if it's just a solo piano piece, you need all three of these pillars to make it function, to make it sound polished, effective. Now, the first one is focus, all right? And focus just means that your audience is focusing on the layers that you want them to. For example, the foreground, all right? Whether that's your melody, whether it's a really cool ostinato, a rhythmic idea, a chord relationship, at any given point, there should be a particular layer in your music that is the most important. And if there is a most important layer in your music, typically the melody, not always, uh, it needs to stand out as the most important. Your audience needs to focus on that layer. As a composer, you need to be able to lead your audience through your music. Now, there are always exceptions. For example, an ambient soundtrack has no foreground. All right, it is all more about become, creating more of a mood, an atmosphere. And these are typically very long pieces of music where there's no melody, there's no particularly interesting lead sounds or rhythmic layers. The point is to just create an atmosphere and allow the audience member to kind of explore, whether that is it completely fades in the background and they're not focusing on the music, or whether they're just kind of sitting there enjoying the mood and noticing little details here and there. Um, so there are always exceptions, but for the grand majority of music, especially film music, there is almost always going to be a foreground, and this foreground requires focus. Now, that's all well and good, but how do we actually create that focus? All right, so fortunately, there are three strategies that we can use for uh, commanding focus on a specific thing, all right? So by far, the most powerful one is changing material. 
All right. This essentially means that anytime you have something new, anytime something is developing or novel, your audience's attention is going to snap to that layer. All right. This is theoretically, I believe, uh, lots of people have told me this, but it has to do with how human beings have evolved. How we as a species have survived is our ability to pinpoint things that are different, things that are new, things that stick out. It's a survival mechanism. So in music, it works really well. If you think about the elements that tend to demand the most attention, they tend to be melodies. All right, a melody is growing, developing, changing over time. A repeating ostinato does not. A chord progression that moves very slowly is technically changing, but not as quickly or as dramatically as a melody. Now, because your ear will snap towards changing materials, this becomes one of the most powerful tools you have for controlling focus. So anytime you want an element to fall into the background, just make it more repetitive. All right, this is very common in action music uh, because lots of movement, lots of rhythm, lots of big noises demands attention. But if you take an ostinato and establish it and get it repetitive, it will almost immediately fall into the background. When you hear an idea for the first time, cool, it demands attention. And when it repeats for the first time, okay, we've established it as important. But when it repeats for a third time, suddenly it's no longer important and it falls into the background. It's supporting material. Does that make sense? All right, that's going to be very important to keep in mind. So our next idea is activity. All right, this means that more rhythmically active layers demand more attention. All right, something with higher energy because it's moving faster or it's uh, moving more, uh, that's pretty much moving faster. Rhythmic layers will demand more attention. So if I am playing a chord progression, all right, in the top end, I'm just going one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And in the upper hand, I'm going. Chances are your ears are focusing on that top layer, that. And you probably noticed that as I played it over and over again, it got more repetitive because there's, of course, all of these things work together. And uh, different things that demand attention can build together, different things that don't demand attention can also help pull, work together to force something in the background. But for the most part, something that's more rhythmically active will demand more attention. The cool thing about balancing that is if you have a rhythmically active layer, like an ostinato, but you don't want it to be in the foreground, just make it repetitive. All right. By far, novel changing material is the most powerful tool we have. Activity, like lots of rhythmic activity, is another really powerful tool, but it's not as powerful as changing material. Now, the third and final tool that we have is also the weakest, but still useful, and it's called pitch. Because all things being equal, a pitch that is higher will demand more attention than a pitch that is lower. That is typically why when you hear about chord progressions, the top line or the soprano being the most important is because when it's a chord progression, our ears snap to the top line. It has the highest pitch. Everything else is changing at the same time. Everything else has the same activity. So all things being equal, the highest pitch demands the most attention. Now you can use these three tools to help make sure your foreground, your most important element is the most interesting. You can make sure it has the most kind of new material, changing material. Even if it is itself a repetitive layer, you can try bringing new instruments to the mix. You can try changing it to a different octave. Adding something new will demand more attention. Anything that is more rhythmically active will also demand more attention. Um, anything that's a higher pitch you can use, is, again, more attention. Now, again, these do follow a hierarchy. Changing material is the most powerful. Then activity is second most powerful than pitch while well, powerful is still the weakest. So these are your three most kind of useful tools for making sure whatever your most important layer is, your audience will focus on this. So for example, your melody. At any given point, you want your melody to be the most interesting and you can use a combination 
of any of these three to achieve that. Typically, because of the nature of melodies, since they develop a little more linearly or a little more horizontally than any other layer, you're probably going to have a bit, this will come a bit more naturally. Uh, but that is pillar number one. Are there any questions? I feel like I wish I had had a bit more of a kind of examples to share. In fact, let's why not? Let's just do this. Let's come up with an example, shall we? I'm going to write a quick example, and while you guys are at it, I will, and while I'm working on this and sharing it, you guys can add any questions in the comments and I will address them. So let's zoom in a little bit. Let's look at this a bit closer. So let's just get an interesting chord combination, shall we? Then we'll go D. This is one of my favorite chord combinations. A minor triad and a major triad, a perfect fourth away. So now we can start adding a rhythmic layer on top. So what if we try, um, let's just see where I, here we go. Yeah, let's go through E and A or A. Now. We'll go to F sharp. All right, so all I'm gonna do I'm going to lower this a little bit, and we're going to hear how we've got an interesting little idea. Very simple idea, but interesting idea. Let's make these 16th notes, actually, now that I think of it. Let's delete these. And again, I will answer questions in just a moment, so if you have any, throw them below. And then let's just pop this up. I actually probably didn't need it there. There we go. So yeah, we've got this first idea. So a very simple idea. Let's lower the velocity up here a little bit. Let's add a little bit of randomness. And we've got, it's like I said, super simple idea. And that top layer. All right, that top idea is the most interesting. It has the most rhythmically active. It has the most activity, but so far there's not a lot of changing material. So it would be very easy to overcome it. So if we repeat this again and we establish it as repetitive, you'll see how quickly it gets very boring, very fast. This is a very weird tempo to be working on this. Fe it feels unnatural to be moving this fast with this combination. But suddenly, if around here, I just started adding something down here. Let's say. Let's go C. Let's try it. I don't have no ideas. This is in three, three times. This sounds awful. What am I doing? Um, it's because I'm just working in three, three time, and I think it's in four, four time. Um, but the idea is like, so if we get a little melody going here, let's swap. It gets repetitive. So again, nothing impressive. I'm just kind of throwing stuff out there. But you can see how your attention shifts. All right. First, if you start with just the chords and the rhythm, you're going to focus on the rhythmic idea. The moment it becomes repetitive, you're going to immediately start kind of dancing or shifting focus towards that new idea. Or whatever it was I played. I'm not one of the world's great improvisers. I can barely play piano as it is. Uh, but it's all right because it hasn't slowed me down before, other than situations like this, of course. Uh, but yeah, so basic kind of premise here. Don't know how effective that example was. I probably should have prepared an example ahead of time, but that's okay. Um, so yeah, pillar number one, focus. 
Basic idea, make sure your most important layer is demanding attention like the most important layer can do it. Uh, the most powerful tool you have is to make it the most changing, the most new, most interesting layer. Uh, other strategies include activity and pitch. And of course, you can use the inverse of these to make something fall into the background. You have something that is rhythmically active and you want it to fall into the background, make it very repetitive. You have something that is very repetitive, but you want it to demand a bit more attention, make it more rhythmically active and give it a higher pitch compared to the other layers. There's all kinds of little cool strategies you can have. Now, I feel like I gave you guys enough time to ask some questions. Um, Darlene, Mike, uh, Miley, so does that mean changing chords will create more attention? Yes, definitely. Uh, whether or not shifting chords or changing key centers is enough to maintain attention in the chords is another matter entirely. Uh, remember that the most frequently changing material will demand the most attention. If you are swapping chords frequently, um, then sure. But if your melody is developing faster than your chords and your melody is higher in pitch and more rhythmically active than your chords, your melody will demand more attention. Um, Sean, how do we know what kinds of changes to do? Picking something random doesn't work as good as I'd want it to. Excellent question. So what changes to make is going to be informed by basically everything we've been talking about in this class. Uh, so we talk about how you add new themes. Your themes, we talked in lesson three, I believe, about three structures for developing a melody. You have period structure, sentence structure, and sequencing structure, I believe, are the three that we introduced. That is just natural development. That's changing. Your motif is developing. That is a change. Uh, having a repetitive ostinato where the rhythmic values, the rhythmic pattern repeats, that's a repetitive value. Uh, so understanding how to implement which changes should always be dictated by the decisions you've made to tell your story. Because at this point, let me pull up my notes, we have all kinds of notes, right? Um, and spotting notes, we have shifts in contour. And as we were talking about shifts in contour, these important moments of change within a scene, we know that there need to be relative changes. So for example, in the motions, the opening scene starts out kind of slow, lethargic, a little lazy. We're in an empty uh, store where the piñata has not had a customer in who knows how many days. All right, then with the tick marks, when we see how long the piñata has been lonely, we got to change a bit to defeated feel. <coughs> Excuse me, I got a tickle in my throat. Um, then we swap to excitement. There are all these natural shifts that we can go through. And there are, these are all ways that you can kind of have your story dictate when to make the changes. Now, the types of changes you make within the texture, that depends, again, on a case-by-case -case scenario. But this is something where this focus tends to come very naturally to most composers. So I wouldn't get overly worked up about it. I'm sorry, I just got this tickle in my throat that won't go away. Um, in general... When it comes to focus, this is something that will come very naturally to you, all right? Anyone who wants to write music, chances are you've been listening to music almost your entire life. So you have a natural feel for how these things are supposed to work. If that is the case, focus will typically come kind of intuitively. The one moment where I'd say you really need to focus on focus, ironically, uh, wordplay, um, but when you need to give more attention to your focus pillar is when something's not working. All right, when you are writing your orchestration, you're writing your arrangement, you're figuring out, all right, something's just not working here. That's when you can dial in and figure out, all right, is my focus properly executed? All right. Um, then, darling, I was looking at your chart on intervals and chord relationships. It appears to me that they are mostly sad. I don't see happy, anger, or calm. And what CRs to use for those emotions? Any suggestions? <clears throat> um, there should be. So what Darlene is talking about is my blog post. So let's go to uh, one of the earlier blogs and videos I did was on chord relationships and emotions. It is by far, I do on how do you write a good motif? How do you portray emotions with music? How do you write a chord progression? All these cool little things, but down here, where is it? Ah, uh, this is by far my most popular uh, blog post. I talk about these things called CRs, all right? Or chord combinations, chord relationships. Things like, let's move it, this little whimsical feeling that I really like, this kind of 
fantasy feeling. The idea of a chord relationship is that chords have been used so frequently in certain situations that they now almost inherently contain a certain level of um, emotion or context tied to them. For example, this one. Very adventurous, kind of outer spacey sci-fi kind of sound. And all it is is a major triad separated by another from another major triad by a tritone. So Darlene, on this chart, this is of course completely subjective. These are just kind of things I found. There are technically only so many negative ones. Then there's neutral and then there's a bunch of bright ones. For example, a very common romantic combination is one to four. And then of course we have the typical romantic cadence, which is a which is a uh, major four, minor four, and one. It's a very cliche kind of romantic cadence to work with. Um, wonder and transcendence being that one that I love so much. Um, but there are so many different kind of combinations you can come up with. Um, um, there shouldn't be any kind of lack of kind of sounds that you want. Um, but I would just recommend, if you want something happy, emphasize brighter chords. That means emphasize major chords. So if you're looking for a very happy sound, go from a major chord to another major chord. If you want something of a more nuanced but still optimistic sound, find some combination of a minor chord going into a major chord. Uh, so hopefully that helps. Uh, Matt Lewis, what tempo is this in? This miserable little thing? I, I don't know. What is it? I think it's like 72 around there. Uh, 70. All right, so it's 70, and I believe in 3-4 time. It's, yeah, I don't know why it was in 3-4. Uh, must be something to do with my sketches. But, uh, Shankar, but diatonic third movements up are pretty good for calm. Also, yes, so median harmony. So moving up diatonic thirds. So that means you start with one chord, C major. What's the next chord, a third up? E minor. What's the next chord up, a th uh, third? G major. Then we've got B diminished, so I'm probably just to swap that to B minor. Um, and just kind of moving up by thirds. That's uh, something we've talked about before in terms of just creating chord progressions through establishing patterns. Excellent, good. I think I've caught up on people's comments. Uh, yeah, let's see here. All right, so pillar number two. If you've been following along with the notes below, you probably know this already, but the next pillar is separation. And this one, this one tends to be where people start to mess up. All right, this is by far the one pillar that I've had to correct the majority of my students on. I teach private lessons. If you're interested, check out the website. But for the most part, a lot of the issues I run into, especially with beginner orchestrators, is this idea of separation, or this idea that each layer should sound distinct from the others. Which means if I'm listening to your music, I should be able to tell what the bass line is. Or I should be able to tell what the melody is. Or I should be able to tell what your chord progressions are, whatever your accompaniment is. The most common issue is that with lots of music that I hear people write, especially kind of uh, beginner levels or intermediate level composers, is I cannot tell what your melody is. All right, so that becomes an issue of focus. Uh, but oftentimes it's an issue of separation as well. Now, just as I mentioned, we've got these three things. You can remember these three with the... Uh, with the reminder CAP, C-A-P, changing material, activity, and pitch. We have multiple strategies that can also help us create uh, separation. So I'm going to paste that. Um, so there are four strategies that I like to work with. All right, so separating, I will just say separating by pitch, separating by articulation types, separating by rhythmic values, and of course, separating by timbre, All right? And this one we are going to remember by the word part, P-A-R-T, pitch, articulation, rhythm, and timbre. These are four incredibly powerful tools. And the basic idea here is that the more of these you use to separate or distinguish two layers, the more separate they're gonna sound, the more distinct from each other they will sound. However, the more you have in common the more they're gonna sound related. So for example, if I'm writing a chord progression, all right, and my chords are all around the, uh, between the octave of G, let's say G3 to G4. That's the G below middle C to the G above middle C. So they're all around within the same octave, all right? 
these voices are now sounding related to each other by pitch because they're all close to each other. Um, if they're all just playing sustained notes, a sustained patch. So all my notes are just kind of playing this kind of note. Uh, rather than having one do a short articulation, so where the C kind of cuts out. But we're not doing that. We're having everything play a uniform kind of articulations. Again, they're going to sound related. If they're all following the same rhythm, so we're moving around. These are all sounding like related notes. It sounds like a chord progression. I'm not hearing separated by and so I'm not hearing I'm hearing the whole thing put together and again timbre these are all being played by the piano so they all sound like a single layer this sounds like a chord progression now if I were to separate things all right say I've got my chords but my melody is being played an octave higher I have now separated these layers by pitch, which helps them sound a little more distinct. All right, we hear distinctions in pitch. We also hear distinction in articulation. One is sustained, one is legato. So similar articulations, but separate. But the most important one here being rhythm. One is just sustained chords. The other one is playing a combination of different rhythmic values to create a motif. All right, and then timbre, it's the same thing. It's all being played by piano. Now, the more of these you use to create a distinction between your layers, the more distinct and separate those layers will sound. So as a general rule, when you are orchestrating for a full orchestra, if you can get at least two of these to separate each layer, you're good. The golden amount would be three. So I'd want to say, all right, so my melody is separate from my orchestration, from my chords by pitch, rhythm, and we'll say timbre. All right, so my chords are being played by strings. Uh, my melody is being played by the flute, an octave higher. All right, different timbre colors, different rhythms, different pitch areas create separation, it is now very easy to separate them. Now, if I am having chords and, and a melody being played by the string section, and my melody is in the middle, some of the chord tones are above it, some of them are below it, and they're all strings, and it's a very slow moving melody that sounds very kind of legato and slow rhythms like half notes and quarter notes, it's gonna be a lot harder to separate those ideas. So the main idea, to maintain separation, if your orchestration, if your arrangements sound blurry, if they sound muddy or they sound non-distinct, unclear, you probably have an issue with both separation and focus. So my first tip would be go through, find a way to make each of your most important layers distinct. Make sure your bass line, chords, and melody all sound a bit more distinct from each other. In particular, in particular, your background material should be separated from your foreground significantly. All right, whenever possible. You wanna use at least three of these to separate your foreground layers from your background layer. And if it's just comparing background layers, like chords and the bass line, then typically just two of these will be fine. Uh, any questions about that? You guys are being pretty quiet now, I think. Uh, but uh, so yeah, I think I'll move on. If you guys have questions about separation, let me know. The last pillar we're gonna talk about is called balance. All right, this one, it's pretty simple, all right? If you have separation and focus, then all layers should otherwise be relatively equal, all right? This has a lot to do with a bunch of things, but first and foremost, typically your frequency content, all right? If you have good focus and separation that helps define your melody, your chords, and your bass line, then there's not really a reason why your melody should be significantly louder than the other layers. Because if it already has enough focus, if you can already tell that the melody is the most important material and you have no issue separating the melody from the other layers, there's not really a reason to focus on making it louder than the rest. All that's gonna do is hurt the balance of your mix. All that's going to do is make your music sound a little 
less professional. All right now, that's not to say that everything has to have equal volume. What that means is everything should have equal representation in size. So if your melody, for example, if your melody uses large instrumentation, then so should your other layers. All right, so if you have a large sound on your melody, let's say you've got a couple trumpets playing your melody. We're not talking about instrumentation size in terms of number of instruments. We're talking about like the power. So if you've got a couple trumpets playing your melody, you're going to need some strong instruments playing the chords. You're going to need some equally strong instruments to play the bass. Because if your melody is significantly stronger, again, your balance is going to be off. You're going to have a lot of power on the melody and the rest is going to feel weak and off to the side. So volume can be used to correct things. You can have certain layers be a little bit quieter to help with separation and focus. But if you'll notice, I never added dynamics to either of these. And that's the main reason, because if you over rely on dynamics to focus on which is the most important layers and which one's in the background, you're gonna throw off your balance. So all of these are kind of abstract ideas. I'm hoping to give some examples before the end of this lesson, uh, depending on how much time we have. Um, but these are the three pillars of great orchestration. If you can have focus, separation, and balance in your orchestration and your arrangement at all times, then you are, you're good, all right? There's always gonna be different things you can do to improve it, but if you have these things at minimum, you will have a great arrangement. Um, any questions on this before we move on? You guys are being fairly quiet. Um, Darlene, all right, so Darlene says, I guess I'm still confused by the terms layers. Excellent point, I never defined that, did I? All right, so a layer in your music is a distinct idea, all right? A distinct layer of your music. For example, your melody can be one distinct idea in your music. Your bass line can be another distinct layer in your music. Your chords can be another distinct layer. You can have ear candy, you can have a pedal tone, you can have all these different distinct ideas. So if we look at my sketch, all right, we have, a couple distinct ideas, right? We have the chords and the bass line to begin with. But once we get in here, let's listen to it. There are three distinct ideas in my sketch. Maybe there will be more in my arrangement, we'll see. But the three distinct ideas I count are my melody, all right? All right, all right. This, again, I am not a talented piano player, so it goes B minor, uh, B and D. Yeah, this idea here, you see it. Uh, this is my melody. My melody is one distinct layer of my sketch. It is one roll. Then another layer, is my chord progression. All right, this is a distinct idea. I can play this chord progression by itself and it will still sound complete. C major, D minor, A minor. That sounds distinct. I can play my melody by itself and it sounds distinct. My bass line is another distinct idea. I can play this bass line by itself. It's its own idea. So there's a concept in music called texture. And texture is essentially refers to the number and types of layers that you're working with at any given point. For example, there are things called linear textures, which means you're basically just working with your melody. All right, there might be different ways of arranging your melody. Like for example, here I have my melody being harmonized in thirds. That's one way of doing it. There's a bunch of strategies. I've got a video about it in one of the playlists included in the lesson plan that you can watch. But there are things called accompanimental textures, which is technically what this is. It's your melody 
that is being accompanied by harmonic material. Um, then there are things called soundscaping textures, which are a melodic. They have no melody. So let's think they have no, I should say primary melody because counterpoint is technically a soundscape texture. It's multiple melodies layered on top of each other, but none of them are singularly more important than the others. So when you have distinct ideas, that's where these three pillars come to play. All right. I need to make sure that for this texture, my melody commands the most focus. I want the audience to be paying attention to my melody. I don't want them to be ignoring my melody and paying attention to my chord progression. All right, and to accomplish this, I have these three things. My melody is the most interesting material. It changes the most frequently. Uh, it is the most rhythmically active, and it's the highest pitch. So chances are my melody is gonna demand the most attention. Separation, my melody is higher than my chords. My chords are higher than my bass line. So they're all separate by pitch. Articulation type, my melody is a little bit more legato. My bass line is a bit more sustained, and my chords are a bit more staccato, a little short. It doesn't always have to be that dramatic. I just need to make sure that my melody is a little bit more distinct from my background. Uh, they all have their own unique rhythms. That separates them. And when I orchestrate this, they will all have a different timbre, although for now it's all played by the piano. And the ideal, if you notice, is the melody and bass line and everything, you can't really pick out which one is which with my velocity down here. All right, it's not like I have my melody highlighted and I just cranked it up. All right, they don't have any one layer that is ridiculously more powerful than the others. I've maintained fairly decent balance between them. But again, this is a sketch. I haven't orchestrated yet. Uh, let's see here. Awesome. Uh, Keldon, how do pads and other atmospheric sounds affect separation? Excellent point. So, again, separation has to do with distinct layers. So, pads and atmospheric layers like that can be distinct from the others because... They don't really have a lot of articulation. With a pad, it shifts over time. So you're holding it, and you're basically sustaining notes. So that could be separate from the other layers. Uh, there's not really a rhythmic component. So that's, again, separating it. It has a unique sound. So again, the separation isn't about how like does your music sound segmented. It's just at any given point, can you listen to your music? And while you're listening, it could you pinpoint which in which layers are which? So if you have your pads and you've paid attention to the idea of separation, you're good and you don't need all four of these. So who cares if your pads are overlapping other layers across pitch so long as they're separated by articulation, rhythm and timbre? Who cares if your chords and bass line are all played by the strings so long as they have different pitch articulation and rhythms or even just two of those or even one of them or something to make them a little distinct. Because again, everything is going to sound like a complete arrangement, like one piece of music. You're not trying to make everything sound blocky and chopped up. You're just trying to make them sound a little more distinct. Now, I wish I really should have prepared a, an actual example for all of this. And I apologize for that. Um, maybe in the next class I do, I'll make sure to have that. Um, I mean... I could pull up one of my pieces that I've worked on in past projects and kind of go through these concepts if you guys would like. Let me know. Um, but for now, if you do, I'll show you. But if not, we'll kind of move on because we do have other stuff that we need to talk about. Uh, Sean, I'm assuming other instruments doubling a melody or just working together is part of the same layer when it's ranged. Yes. Um, all the instruments performing the melody, that's still the melody. That's still one layer. And that is actually a very nice kind of segue to our next topic, uh, Sean. Oh, uh, thank you. Which is picking the right instrument. All right. So as a quick disclaimer, all right, there is a really beautiful kind of effect in music that as long as an instrument can do two things, as long as it can physically play the part and perform the part expressively, meaning in a good register, uh, for the instrument. Other than that, it doesn't really matter what instrument you choose. Every single instrument has this indefinable ability to sound essential. So, for example, if you decide that both the French horn and the cello are viable options to play your melody, and you don't know which one to choose, it doesn't matter which one you go with at the end, because whichever option you choose, if they're both options, or they're both good options, it's going to sound like um, 
it's going to sound perfect for the role. It's going to sound like nothing else could work. If you play the cello on the melody and your audience becomes accustomed to the cello, then it's going to sound like, oh, no other instrument could have done this. All right, this just sounds good. And that's the beautiful thing about getting an actual performance, whether you have a musician or you're just really good with your sound libraries. Um, once you've selected an instrument, it will sound like it was a natural choice. It's just about finding out what your options are. Now, there is a process for this. All right. And actually, you know, instead of typing this out, I'm just going to share my notes up here. So you guys can follow along. These notes are downloadable with the link in the description. Right click, open a new tab and you can follow along. But the first step to figuring out which instrument should play, for example, your melody is to start by thinking about which emotion or idea are you trying to portray? All right. And be specific. All right. Actually, take your time to think about this. By now, you should have no issues with this because we will have spent a significant amount of time figuring things out by studying your film. But figure out what it is you're trying to portray with your music. Then go through and figure out which instruments you think could deliver that kind of performance. Don't worry about whether it could physically perform the role. Just create a list. All right. Think about what you can actually use and come up with a list of which instruments could, for example, portray a sad Melody, oboe, can that play a sad melody? Definitely, can the violin play a sad melody? Awesome, can the tuba? I mean, I have no doubt that a super talented tuba player could probably do it, but for the most part, I don't see any of my sound libraries being expressive enough to deliver a tragic, sad melody, all right? So just kind of think about which instruments you can view on this. Now, this does take time and experience. One of the best ways to figure out which instruments can actually play the role is to listen to music, all right? You wanna know what instruments can play sad music? Listen to a bunch of sad, oops, knocked my phone off my desk, sorry. Listen to a bunch of sad pieces from your favorite film scores. Take notes, who plays the melody? What instruments, is it a solo instrument? Is it an ensemble? What's going on? Just kinda of take notes. If you'd like, you can create a list that you can reference, but for the most part, just listening actively and trying to think, all right, this music is happy sounding to me, why? Um, and that actually tends to be one of my specialties. If you want to learn more about uh, uh, how emotions are portrayed with music, that is something I would love to talk about. I've done it in a couple of videos. I actually just did a video on Patreon, a Patreon exclusive, where I got to talk for an hour about my specific process for portraying emotions. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but no, no, I got to stay on stop. I got to I'm going to go down. A, I'm going to go down. A, it's very easy for me to chase a rabbit down a hole. Um, yeah, so create a list of instruments that you think are potential. Instruments that you could see, is it capable of portraying this emotion? Is it capable of portraying this feeling of this character? If so, go for it, just consider it, all right? We're not looking at anything too specific yet, but the next step is to start eliminating, all right? Start looking at your sketch, all right? You think If you decided oboe, flute, violin, French horn, and cello are all great options for this instrument, all right? You start looking at the roles, all right? You could say, all right, this, Melody is particularly agile, meaning you have to move, switch directions a lot. You have to play very rapidly. All right, it's probably going to say oboe and French horn are off the picture, right? Neither of those are particularly agile instruments. Uh, so again, we're looking at which ones can perform this part. Even if they can perform it physically, is it still going to have kind of the emotional feel you're looking for? So this is all about a process of elimination. And it does, like I said, require a little bit of experience, a little bit of knowledge of how these instruments can be used. I do have videos that introduce you to different instruments, but like I said, the best way is to listen to music. Um, uh, oh yeah, I've got notes here on how you can study music. Oops, uh, how you can study instrumentation. All right, take notes on pieces. Yeah, so yeah, awesome. So I, I couldn't remember if I included this or not. But that's basically it. All right, when you want to figure out the right instrument to play a layer, whether it's your chords or it's your melody or it's your bass line, start by figuring out what emotion, what vibe, what mood am I trying to evoke here? Make a list of which instruments could play this and potentially evoke that mood or that emotion. Now, once you've got kind of a grand list of everything that potentially can do it, start to have a process of elimination. All right, which instruments, all right, how loud is it? What's the range I need? Which of these instruments, while capable of portraying the emotion I want, will not be able to do it while playing this specific part that I have written? Eliminate them, and once you've got a short list, just try them out. Which one do you like the best? Because again, this kind of golden rule 
that the instruments have an uncanny knack of sounding indispensable. Meaning once you've made a decision, as long as it's capable of producing the mood you want, as long as it's capable of producing the mood you want while playing the part you wrote, if it can do those two things, it's gonna have this uncanny ability to sound indispensable. It's gonna sound like no other instrument could replace it. And that's just the magic of a good performance, whether it's an actual musician performing the part or it's a sound library that you just know very, very well. Um, let's see here. <laughs> One comment, Sean. Tragic triangle player. That would... You know what? I, I like that. I wonder if that'd be possible. I, I'd, I'd say it'd have to be like... I think it'd be possible. I, I, I bet there'd be, you'd have to do some kind of sound design thing. But now you've got all these thoughts going in my head, Sean. Um, all right. So last kind of new topic we'll talk about because we are running out of time. Um, so if you have any questions, let me know. I will be around until a little bit after 4 p.m. local time. So if you see this little clock down here. Um, but uh, doubling, very simple. It's the idea of just picking one instrument that's playing the role and then you want another instrument to join it. There are a couple different strategies you can use for this, but the general rule I want to share right off the bat is never double without a reason. And the reason can never be you want to double and use this instrument because you haven't used that instrument yet. That is never a good reason to use an instrument, right? And it's terrible to say that because that is the instinct of most beginning composers, most beginning orchestrators. You think, I haven't used the French horn yet. I really should find a place to use it. No, 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 no. If you don't have a reason to use the French horn, then don't use the French horn, all right? Especially when you're starting out, you're not paying a French horn player to just sit there and not play. No, you've got your sound libraries, all right? Only use what you need because there are many strengths behind the modern orchestra or any ensemble for that matter. The, one of the greatest strengths is a variety of tone colors, all right? And if you are constantly using the whole orchestra, then you are robbing yourself of that strength. You are only using one tone color, and that is the color of the entire orchestra playing at the same time. So if you can get away with using only the flute, then use only the flute. Don't throw in the clarinets and the bassoons and the oboe and the harp just because you want to use those instruments. You should have a clear reason. Now, some of those reasons are, as you can see here, wanting to develop a specific interesting tone color, all right? Or you want to cre increase the power or prominence of a part to maintain balance. That balance we talked about earlier, about having similarly sized instrumentation. So if your melody has large instrumentation, then your other layers should too. If your melody has small instrumentation, and again, this is not in terms of the number of instruments, it's in terms of the amount of power that they all have, um, then the other layers should all match it. Now, depending on which of these two primary reasons that you want to elicit. Um, there are different strategies. For example, like doubling. This is where you're doubling instruments from the same section, or in the case of the woodwind, this group, subsections. So if I take the first violins and I'm doubling them with the second violins, that's not a really interesting tone color, all right? We're not creating something new. If I double the flute and the piccolo, Again, very similar colors. That's not a new, interesting tone color. What it does result in is more power and more prominence. All right? Now, if you want an unlike doubling, that's where you take instruments with very different sounds. For example, the cello and the French horn. This results in a louder, more prominent sound, but the most powerful impact is going to be on creating this new composite sound. So again, two types of doubling. So you have a doubling where you're doubling instruments with very similar sounds. And in that case, the biggest impact is just a louder sound. And then you have instruments where you're combining different, very different sounds, in which case, yes, there's going to be some louder volume going on, but the biggest shift is going to be merging those sounds together. Um, now, if you want to figure out which instruments to merge together, my best advice to you is to start with a primary instrument. All right, follow those steps we just learned. Figure out what instrument is the best option to play, for example, your melody. Then figure out what elements am I missing. All right, so if you've got the melody being played by the flute, 
and it's a beautiful little thing, but you want a slightly pluckier attack. You want a stronger start to each note. Um, then you can start exploring different note options. Something you might choose is the marimba or the xylophone or a very common one being the harp. Harp and flute double each other very often, uh, in which case you get a predominantly flute heavy sound, but with a pluckier, stronger attack. Um, so again, when you want to figure out how to, which instruments to blend, start by figuring out which instrument is the closest to the sound you want, and then figure out what it's lacking, what you want to add. Now within these, there are additional options, right? Doubling in unison, which means they are playing the same exact part, which for the most part emphasizes gluing those colors together. So if the cello and French horn are playing the exact same part, those sound waves are going to mesh with each other. The, uh, Frequencies are going to mesh together. It's going to create a new sound. Um, if they double in octaves, meaning one instrument plays the same part, the other plays the same part, but an octave higher or lower, then they're not going to blend so much. They'll still blend if they've got different sounds, but the bigger emphasis is creating a wider presence for your sound. So again, more prominence, going back to these two primary reasons. Do you want a more interesting color, or do you want more power or prominence in a given part? Um... Um, oh yeah, and I've got a couple of examples here. If you want a unique color, focus on unlike doubling in unison, power prominence, focusing in octaves, um, different strategies here. And then, yeah, this is the kind of process uh, that I have. Now, the last thing I was gonna cover today, and I was not expecting to spend as much time on those first three pillars that we did. I was fully expecting to kind of get through that in like five, six minutes. Um, and so I thought we would come through my process here um, and talk about how I approach orchestration and then I would orchestrate scene one in front of you live. Unfortunately, we no longer have time for that. Um, so I will kind of do a brief overview of how I orchestrate things. And then next week, we will actually apply all of this and I will orchestrate this first scene that I've sketched out in front of everybody, you'll be able to see how I navigate those three pillars, how I find the best instruments for my different layers, and then how I manage doubling and all of that stuff. Um, so I'm gonna do a quick overview of how I personally approach orchestration. And after that, um, I'll answer whatever questions are in the comments, but for then we're, gonna, we're getting close to wrap up. So if you have any questions, throw them in the comments below, speak now or forever hold your peace. Oh no, is something wrong with the stream? No, never mind, I thought I saw something, apparently not. But uh, yeah, so I typically start like an inverse pyramid and this is, should come as no surprise. This is the exact process I have used for film scoring. It's what I've been teaching you. Start broad, start vague, and then narrow it down. So at this point, we've already done most of this. All right, we have found our sound palette already. All right, we've figured out which notes are the most important for the part. So I know that I'm gonna have mostly a mariachi type sound for my core ensemble. Then I'll use strings and brass to kind of beef it up, some percussion to beef it up at different moments. But for the most part, I'm gonna, most part, I'm gonna focus on that kind of mariachi group. Um, um, then I talk about horizontal relationships. So basically, if I want to increase energy, how do I do that? For me, I'm probably gonna increase size. All right, so I'll think if I wanna give more drama, more weight, I'll introduce low strings. If I wanna increase uh, tension, more movement, I'll introduce more high strings, stuff like that. Basically, different strategies for how are you applying your sound palette. Again, next week we will demonstrate all of this in much more detail. Um, then after that, I'm gonna go section by section. So for here, this would probably be uh, based off spotting notes. So column per column, essentially. And I figure out how does the energy flow from each one? How many layers are there? What layers are in the foreground? What roles do the other layers play? And this is all kind of stuff we've already figured out a little bit. We found out melody plus chords plus bass line plus counter melody, all these different kind of ideas that I came up with during my spotting notes. Um, but I'm getting more specific. And then finally, the last step I'll do is I will essentially start just making specific plans. All right, so foreground tone colors. Uh, I pick my instruments. Uh, background, uh, I pick my instruments. Uh, then as I'm uploading them out, I make sure that I'm paying attention to those three pillars, all right? So my melody needs to be the most interesting. How am I maintaining this? 
I've probably taken care of that with my sketch already, but this is kind of the idea that I focus on timbre a little bit more. Um, and yeah, it's just kind of applying everything that we've learned today plus a little more. So this lesson turned out to be way more theoretical than I was expecting. I thought we were going to do a lot more application, but that is fine. Uh, because uh, we got to spend more time answering your questions, kind of tackling the most important things. So next week, one week from today, which is going to be, what is it going to be? Uh, that'll be the 27th, June 27th. I am going to orchestrate this sketch live, and I will be applying everything that we learned today and then some to kind of figuring it all out. Um, so I'm excited for that. If you want to learn more about orchestration, like I said, download these notes, read through them, use these tools that I've shared. But if you want to learn more, I've got a number of playlists that are helpful. I have my textbook. Uh, I've actually got it right here. I've got the page, the copy that I'm editing for my publishing company. Nearly 400 pages, 36 chapters, and the last 10 are all dedicated to creating realistic mock-ups using the orchestra, all kinds of cool stuff. And if you're not interested in that, I also have a book on how to make the most out of your li uh, sound libraries. All cool stuff, all recommendations. The playlists are free. Check them out. Don't forget to sign up for the competition if you haven't already. Use coupon code TABLETOP to get 10% off your registration. Um, it's being fun. So I'm not seeing any comments. Uh, hopefully that just means I did a good job explaining things. Uh, but let's listen to this one more time. It'll give us some time to buy some time. I'm going to listen to what I've got written out for scene one. And if people don't have any more questions, I will call it a day. Uh, we will see you next week. But for now, let's watch this. Last chance, throw your questions down below. have a special announcement that I almost forgot. Alright, so we've got our scene there. That's what we will be orchestrating next week. Now my special announcement that I almost forgot to bring up. If you are interested in a copy of my textbook, but you don't have the budget for it, I am raffling off two free copies. The way you can enter this raffle is go to my Instagram page. In fact, let me pull this up, shall we? Uh, go to my Instagram page. Um, here we go. So go to my Instagram page, find this post, and just follow the instructions, all right? Oh, we got some pe more people have posted on it. You're going to follow my page, like the post, and comment with two people. I tag two friends in the comments. And then this Friday, I will be selecting two winners. Uh, typically, I just use like an online, I, I roll some dice or I use an online selector of some sort. So it's completely random, but I am ra uh, raffling off two free copies. So check that out if you are interested in this. It covers everything, harmony, melody writing, orchestrating, mixing, all of it with the idea of a storytelling lens. I unfortunately cannot sell this book any longer starting June 30th. That's the last day where I have to take it off my website because it is currently being published by a large publishing company and there's all kinds of complications there. So if you're interested, grab it before then. June 30th, it comes down and will not be available until it is on bookshelves and stores and stuff. Um, awesome, so that was my special announcement. Um, Darlene, so does one piece of music play for the entire scene? Um, for the most part, that doesn't have to be the piece, uh, the way it is, uh, but this is one cue. Yes, I have written one cue to fit this entire scene. I have certainly done much more fragmented versions on different projects. I have had scenes where it's one scene, but I split it into multiple cues. It all depends on the needs of the story. And we kind of figured that out through the whole spotting process in the earlier episodes of this class um so yeah hopefully um but yeah so yeah it, even though this is one piece of music per, for this scene it doesn't always have to feel like that and darling, what about people who don't use instagram 
Very good question. Uh, if you don't use Instagram, um, find the post I made on YouTube. All right. Oh, actually, that's a good question. I don't know if you can tap people on YouTube, um, Instagram. Ah, uh, man. You know what? For people who are on, who are not on Instagram, I'll have to come up with another raffle. But for now, unfortunately, this is just going to be an Instagram exclusive. Um, just because I hadn't thought about that. So I apologize if that excludes you. Um, I'm going to have to... Uh... So one thing you could do, and this is I, this is a little bit extra work, I, uh, is you could make a temporary Instagram account, sign up, like the page, like the comments, t uh, tag... You can tag me in the post if you want. That would count. Uh, tag me twice. Uh, go for it. And then after the raffle, if you don't like Instagram, just delete it. Delete your account. Destroy it. Um, but at the moment, yes, unfortunately, this will be an Instagram exclusive. Uh, just because, uh, yeah, I hadn't really thought about that. I've already made the announcement. So apologies for that. Uh, but, uh, yeah. So that brings us to the end of the stream. I hope you found it helpful. Uh, don't forget to like the channel, subscribe to the channel, like the video. This all helps quite a bit. Um, next week, we will be tackling the actual orchestration of this scene. I hope you are there. All right, so have a good day, my friends. I had a lot of fun. I hope you did too. Keep studying, keep working hard, keep writing new music. I will see you all next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.